All right, is this on? We're testing out with some new technology today because I don't do so good standing behind a podium. I like to move around and talk and engage with you. Though we're also struggling with, I don't know that my PowerPoint is going to work. So you're going to have to have a strong imagination today. Um, and I was going to have you interact the same way as I had a couple of weeks ago with your phones. Again, the technology isn't working, so I may just ask you to yell out and be bold. And if you're one of those people who is silent and doesn't want to say anything, but you have a really good thought, this is my wife and I. I say stuff all the time, and it's thought out about this much. My wife doesn't talk as much, but oh my goodness, her thoughts are so deep. So if you're one of those people and you're sitting next to the person who will talk loudly, just poke them and say, here's what you should say, okay? I, I try to make other allowances with the computer for that to work, but it's not working for us. This week, as I came to Pentecost, I had this plan from a number of weeks ago, and I was like, oh, we're going to talk about Pentecost. Here's where we're going. This is the direction we're going. And then in June, we're going to pick up more and talking about the Spirit. And I got to this week, and I started working on it a little bit more, and I started going, ah, this isn't quite what I was expecting. And then I met with the young adults, Yabba Dabba Doo, and we were talking through, and what we're doing is we're going through the Bible. We started off with the two creation stories, and yes, there are two there at the beginning. And then we moved to the next set of four stories, which really are stories of breaking of relationship, of falling, or of different types of sin happening. And in those stories, I often make the connection between the Tower of Babel and Pentecost. And this time as I was doing that, I started going, ooh, ooh, I'm getting a ring here. You were good? Okay. When I started looking at it, I started saying, ooh, there's some tones here of racism and of colonialism, and my culture is right and yours isn't, which I didn't feel comfortable with. So I went and I talked with my dad, who's a bit more of a theologian than I am, and he sent me an article and I read it and I was like, ooh, yeah. And it said really well, and that will be closer to the end of the sermon. So there was the sermon I was going to do, and then you're getting sort of a little taste of that, and then we're going to be going a different direction than normal. But we are going to be dealing with Pentecost, and we're going to be dealing with the coming of the Spirit. And I didn't want the Scripture read before I did a little bit of an explanation. See, Scripture is built that it is layered on on top of stories. So it's, here's a story, then the next story comes, and it helps you to rethink that other story. And then we tell another story that goes to that story and the story before, and we do another one that's that story, that story, and that story. And it's this layer and layer and layer of meaning and story. And often there are patterns that repeat that are supposed to help you remember the story that came before. So as we read this story, what I want you to do is be thinking about two things. What's the imagery that comes up for you? And what are the, the imagery or the stories from past stories in Scripture that this triggers for you? Or maybe one that comes later on in Scripture that you're like, oh, this is the next story along that builds on Pentecost. Does that make sense what I'm asking you there? So I'm going to invite three of the youth and... I'll invite them to come up, and they're going to read the scripture. So if you guys want to come forward, come on up, come on up. And as you're hearing this story, again, thinking, hearing them, and we're not going to have anything else visual, because I want you to be having your imagination trigger what are the images that come in this story, and what stories do they build on? What images have you heard before? All right, and I'll let them, and I'll move my stuff out of the way. Uh, Acts 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were, all so suddenly t they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered 
and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the na native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked. Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. And the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you. What images came to mind as we were reading that or hearing that? What images jumped into your mind? Confusion. Let's say that one again. A red moon. Okay. What other images came to mind? So everybody hearing in a, a, the language that they understood. Yes, that's a key part. We're going to come back to it. Sneering bystanders. Sneering bystanders. Look at all the drunk guys. Yeah. I don't think often this kind of church, they'll look at us and say, oh, yeah, the spirit's there. Look at all those drunk people. Maybe we have to, but, you know, we can work on it. <laughs> what were some of the stories that you you thought of, or what, what did these images lead back to? What are stories that this one might be built on? Egypt. Egypt. Okay, a little bit more specific. What from that Egypt story? There's a big story. So you were saying there, I'm saying this so the people online can hear some of what you said, of saying the, the blood moon, the, um, the confusion, and um, the, the great wind. Yes, yeah. There's one other piece from that story. Actually, there's two other pieces around that story that I was particularly thinking about. But I'll ask before I come to those two, what other images did you think of? Or what other stories was this one bringing up? I was thinking of um, Elijah wanting to see God and uh, hiding in the cleft of the rock and the wind and everything going, going past it. So Elijah, and that is a great one. And it's interesting because Elijah's there and a, a wind comes. And in that story, I love that story because the rocks get smashed all the time. It says, and a great wind came up and picked up the rocks and smashed them together. And then a big fire came and it smashed the rocks. And it's like, oh, this is cool. The rocks get smashed and there's all this dust around. But interestingly, in that story, it says, and God wasn't in that. So that one is similar but in some ways, God isn't represented in the big and the explosive in that story, which is interesting because that's sort of the opposite of how this story is representing. There's a couple of stories that I'll, I'll mention that I think tie into this one. Two from the Exodus story. When Moses is out and he's run away, he's accidentally, well, or he's intentionally killed somebody, he thinks they're going to kill him, he runs off and he's being a shepherd out in the, the wilderness, 
and he sees a burning bush. Here we have God's spirit represented in a flame. And he comes into God's presence here with a burning bush. And God's presence or spirit is represented as this burning bush. Shortly on in that story, they get led by a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire. And eventually, when they are taught on how to make a space for God, and they have the tent of the tabernacle, then that fire and that pillar comes right over it. Again, it's the idea of God's spirit, God's presence there with it. Now, we also have another tie back to Jesus' story, where we have he is baptized, and like a dove coming down, sort of like the tongues of fire coming down, there's a dove of the Spirit coming down onto him. So we have all of these representations or stories that we're building on, and as the people would have heard this story, and they're like, oh, tongues of fire came onto them, it's like now instead of just one space where there's God, God now has split and is coming into many in a way that is new. Often in all those other stories, there's one flame, or there's one space, or there's one person who God's Spirit has come on. And it's interesting because that story of Joel, which is quoted here, is, and everybody's going to get the Spirit of God. Not just your prophets. Now, prophets are like, I love superheroes. Are any of the rest of you guys superhero fans? I, I'm, I like the artwork. I love it, and it just gets my imagination going. I think of the Old Testament, the prophets are sort of like those superheroes that they get to, they have God's presence and they get to do all sorts of fun stuff. Except for the guy who got mocked for being bald and called out three she-bears and I think that was maybe a misuse of power. But that's, um, just be careful not to mock people about their haircuts, you know, it's dangerous. (laughs) But in those stories, there was a person who had God's presence with them. And it wasn't like God was with them for a long time. God came on them, and God's Spirit was there with them. But often it is for a task or for a time. Here there's something different happening. But these stories are representing of God's presence, God's power, and God's insight, I think, is brought. And it's very significant that it's not just for the holy person, but it's for everybody. And I'm going to encourage you, grab out your Bible, and I want you to look and see who are some of the people who are named here that God's Spirit comes on. So Acts 2, and go down into the part where it's the quote from Joel. And I want you to look, who is it that God's Spirit is poured out on? Now, people expected it to be the holy men, and in that time period, they thought it would have been men, though there are lots of representations in the Old Testament where God's Spirit also came on women. But in their cultural understanding, that's who they thought. Now, what does it say? Who gets the Spirit of God in this? Everybody. But there's some specific groups named, which I think is really interesting. Who does it say? On your slaves, both men and women, everybody, slaves, men and women. Now, it's interesting, they don't quite get this, that God's Spirit is coming on everybody. And if we skip ahead into the story, into Acts 10, Peter still doesn't get it and gets some very big visuals and finally goes into some Gentile's house and he's like, I'm going to preach to them but I don't think he has a lot of faith that there's anything going to happen. And suddenly he sees the Spirit of God pour out on them, and they start prophesying and start speaking, and he's like, oh my, it's for everybody. There is this significant change that God's Spirit has come to those that we don't expect. And I, I think of those three things, of God's presence, God's power, and God's insight or God's understanding. One of the significant things with the Spirit coming to us is I don't think we would understand who God is or who Jesus is or what Jesus is trying to do without the Spirit revealing it to us. The reason why I say this is if you skip back a little bit and you look at chapter 1. Jesus has risen and the disciples who have been with him the whole time are there with him. And he's like, I'm going to send you out. 
And they're like, and now's the time we get to go kill all the Romans, right? And I can just imagine Jesus going, you still don't get it. And he kind of repeats him himself, says, no, you're going to be my, my servants that I spread out, first of all to the Jews, then to the Gentiles, then to the Sumerians, and then to all nations. I'm going to disperse you out. It's interesting that they, they still don't in some ways get that. They start speaking and preaching when the Spirit comes. But it's not until God brings persecution on them there in Jerusalem that they finally get the hint, oh, you actually really wanted us to go out to other people. We thought everybody would come to us. Build it and they will come. Quoting an old movie there, but yes. So God's Spirit coming. We're going to pick up a lot more on the Spirit later. But I want you to think about it. It's God's presence with us. And in that presence is God's power, but in many ways God's understanding. And there's a passage that is often quoted that says, you know, if you pray for anything, if you knock, God will open the door and God will give you things. And it sounds like you pray for anything and God will give it to you. And in the end of that passage, it says, for as good of a father you are, God is a better father, so won't God give God's spirit to you? It's this idea that when we are praying, what we're really praying for is God's spirit to come give us insight give us God's presence, and is there with us. Now that's the sermon I was going to teach, and now I'm going to switch and change gears a little bit. Often I think of Pentecost as also reversing some of what happened in the fall. What in those first fall stories was going wrong, I start seeing some of those things set right when the Spirit comes. But I started struggling that with this this week. Partially because in that earlier story, they all had one language. And then they were building this tower into the heavens. Literally, they thought they could get to heaven. And God says, eh, that's not on. And he mixes up their language. Now, in that story, I have for a long time thought of that as God's punishment for them, that he mixed up their language, stopping them from doing that. I was going to have you do a little poll here at this point, up on the screen, of who thinks that it's punishment, who thinks it's not, or who just doesn't know. So without that, I'm going to say, just a raise of hands, who thinks that this is God's punishment on the people to mix up their language? How many of you thought that? A couple. Yeah, it seems like it. That's what I thought until this week. But I started seeing some problems with that, because that sees diversity and different languages as a problem. Now, I do think that there is a break in relationship that's happening there in that story. They are trying to be, build a tower to be in the heavens, and it says there that they will be like gods, is what they're trying to be. They're trying to create a name for themselves so they're not scattered across the earth. And in that, they're trying to be like God. And that is, in a way, a break between their relationship with them and God. But I also think that it's, it's recognizing that sometimes when we speak to each other, because of sin and because of brokenness, we often misunderstand each other. And in that, there's conflict and break in relationship between us. But I struggle with this idea here of that different languages are punishment. Or different languages or different cultures and being spread to different places is punishment. And I think about that and I'm like, does God then wipe away different relationships, different types of cultures, and we're all supposed to become one culture? I've seen the church kind of do this. They go into a place and not only do they teach their faith, they teach their culture. And you have to speak our language. For so often, it was a particular language that they had to speak in that to, to come and understand that. So, um, I'm blanking, Latin. The masses were done in Latin. So you had to learn Latin to come and be a part of it. Or in the Americas, you had to learn either Spanish or English. They came and they brought their culture and they said, this is what the gospel is, become like us. We're reversing down and this is our culture. And I don't know that that's what this passage is on about. I don't think that this is the direction that this passage is going. So as I wrestled with it, I went back to that story 
about the Tower of Babel, and I want you to do this. I want you to grab your Bible and go back to chapter 11, and I'm going to catch up in my notes. So Genesis chapter 11. And I had this nice picture here that I was going to show you of the Tower of Babel, but uh, it's not big enough on the screen. So this is from Genesis 11, and in chapter 11 is this story of the Tower of Babel. And I want to read just one verse. So I'm going to be reading, uh, so chapter 11, verse 4. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower to it, with its top in the heavens. There they are, trying to be up there with God. And let us make a name for ourselves. Again, this idea of we will be great and remembered. Our names will be like the gods. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So there's this fear of being spread. Now, it's interesting because this isn't very far along in the story of God's people. But they're already, again, trying to do things that are not what they were given instructions to do. I'm going to go just a couple of chapters earlier to the beginning of the story. And if I can get this to go, there we go. In Genesis 1, when God first creates people, so Genesis 1, cha uh, chapter 1, verses 28 God says this, God blesses them. So he's just made humans. He blesses them and says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In other words, scatter over all the earth. So as they came together, they said, no, we don't want to be scattered. We don't want to be forgotten. We don't want to go all these different places. We want to build a name for ourselves and be like God. As I started reading that this week, I started going, ah, this isn't God's punishment, but God's slowly pushing them out and God's bringing them into diversity, which I think better reflects who God is. God is not best seen at looking at me and my culture, but is best looking at the entire world, seeing all of us, all of our many faces, all of our many cultures, hearing our many different tongues, and that gives a better representation of who God is. Not just my culture, but all of our culture. Not just my face, but all of our faces. It gives a better picture of who God is. So jumping back to Acts again. This is Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that's where you are, in Judea, which is your neighbors, and Samaria, which that's your enemies, and to the ends of the earth. Here's this call of God to go out and connect with these different cultures. And then if we go back to our story of Pentecost, they're speaking not in one language that suddenly everybody understands that one language, but they start speaking in everybody else's language. It's not a way, wiping away of culture, but it's a blessing of the diversity that God has made and wiping away some of the difficulties of not being able to understand each other, but not erasing the differences. And I think that is a key part. Diversity is not anti-God. It is a better reflection of God. So at Pentecost, we don't see just a a stopping of culture, but a blessing of culture. Now I'm going to pause there and I'm going to invite um, oh, names just uh, disappeared. Come on up, I, Louise. Uh, yeah. Elise, there we go. <sighs> Sorry. Technology is not working, neither is the brain. There's an article that I read this week about this. And this is from a guy who I know in the US, and um, I've met him, he's a genius, and I'm blanking on his name. Um, me and names. Isaiah Vegas. Um, and he has an article here where he talks about being a person of having 
two languages and having to switch back and forth between those two languages and the different ways of thinking and some of the struggles that he ran into in being places and speaking a language that wasn't quite that. And we're just going to hear the end of his article as he talks with this, and then I'll finish up. And sorry it's a little long, but please listen. Yeah, listen. Okay. In the Babel story, God responds to the people's unified language with multiplicity. God diversifies their tongues. God's no to the tower is a yes to the irreducible variety of creation. This divine intervention is a blessing, not punishment. Babel becomes the site where God works out a vision of redeemed life, the wonders of human diversity, a diversity that mirrors God's nature as an us. This is the same God who swept over the face of the deep at the beginning in the first chapter of Genesis and made human beings in the divine, differentiated likeness, chapter 1, verse 26. Humanity's multiplicity images the multiplicity within God. The aftermath of Babel restores differentiation as God's vision for creation, earthly life as bearing the likeness of heavenly life. What God does at Babel prefigures the events of Pentecost in the book of Acts. The work of the Holy Spirit has already begun in God's affirmation of linguistic and cultural differentiation at Babel. Later, at Pentecost, God descends in a rushing wind, alighting the friends of Jesus with the fire of heaven, empowering them to speak in other tongues. Acts 2 verse 4. There, on the streets of Jerusalem, foreigners hear the gospel in their own languages. The people are astonished at the sounds of their homeland in the mouths of these strangers. God does not speak in a universal language. God does not impose or coerce unity. Instead, the Spirit of God communicates in every tongue. Every dialect is holy, every accent revelatory. The incarnation of God's living word expressed in a plural plurality of mouths and tongues. God indwells differences without converting the multitudes into sameness. People do not give up their languages, their cultures. Instead, God affirms the holiness of human differentiation. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, chapter 2, verse 17. All flesh receives the baptism of the spirit, not to force people into a cultural nationalism, but to consecrate every ethnic difference. The book of Acts tracks the migration of the Holy Spirit as the gospel wanders through peoples and across lands. Evangelism is an intimate transmission, born in a diversity of lives, as collectives entrust each other with the deposit of faith, the differentiated life of God revealed in the flesh. The church, in the multiplicity of our tongues, becomes the body language of God. Thank you. The body becomes the body language of God. I think as the Spirit comes, and as the Spirit is here with us, it is God's presence with us. It gives us insight, it empowers us and emboldens us to go and be God's body here, and a diverse body, one that has multiple faces, multiple languages, multiple cultures. One of my greatest joys being here is coming and seeing people from South Africa, from different Asian countries, from all over Australia, from all over the world. My parents came and sat at morning tea with a group of people and they realized that no one who was at, sitting at that table had been born in Australia. I see that as a great strength. We are a better representation of God through our many cultures and also from our many different viewpoints. When we're not all just in this political camp, but we are from many we represent God better. So as we move forward as a church, as we recognize God's presence with each of us, help us to hold on to our differences, to be able to hear each other and ask the Spirit for us to be able to listen and understand each other, but not to try to make everyone else like ourselves. Because as we hold on to that difference, we hold on to a broader, a bigger, a more full picture of who God is. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much for your coming of your son, of you as Jesus, that dealt with this separation that we had with you. And then thank you for coming, not just as representation in front of us, 
but coming as your spirit to live in us. Help us as we trip over our own struggles and our own judgments and our thinking of my group is better than that group or we're the us and they're the them. Help us to see all people as representing you. Fill us with love and help us stand as a group that is different. And as conflicts come because of our differing views, help us to have your spirit guiding us in ways to live together in unity and peace, but not wiping away our differences. And God, may we be a representation of your body here, filled with your spirit, filled with your love, your power, and your understanding. Pour out your spirit on us and help us to hear your direction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Pastor Micah, uh, and um, uh, I, have to, I was just re reflecting that um, the, how powerful the spirit is and um, the creative ways in which the spirit works. And um, without quite knowing the full extent of what Micah was going to be preaching on today, uh, I, I asked Jack to create a poem and he, without um, knowing what Micah was going to be preaching on, has actually written a poem this week uh, which celebrates the diversity that exists in this church. Uh, so, um, Micah, so Jack has a responsive poem for us. When he's finished that poem, um, if everybody would like to follow the direction of the musicians, I will stand and sing Behold the Lamb of God. That is working. Okay. Uh, before we do that, if you have a Bible and you have it in a language that you are comfortable reading it in, there'll be some words up on the screen in blue. Um, please feel free to read along with me in the language that you are comfortable with. There'll be some words on blue and in various languages. Um, if you can read it, please read out with me. And if you see the word um, everyone, that is just Acts 2.32, but in your own language, do not read out the word everyone. Thank you. Cartwheels and currency, cacophony and Carthaginians in the crowd. A roiling, rabbling rabble come from the world round. Turbans turn and meet puzzled Parthian brows. What is that sound? God has raised this Jesus to life. Do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? Prayers and petitions pause, perplexed. The devout and the Damascan descend on a corner crowded, a house inhabited by delusional denizens. Drunk, probably, but they greet us as friends. Do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? Jews of Jerusalem jumble and jostle, and the news of the Nazarene cuts all. A shame, a shadow, a shared suspicion, a foreign rule, cruel, a crucifix standing tall. But I suppose we're all foreigners here. Is Joe not here? Do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? Murmuring meads, papyrus prayers, and Arabia and Asia Minor stand still. Who else could silence a crowd with a single word? A storm could not be silenced as such. Although, I did hear that story once. Do you hear what I hear? Are we not all foreigners here? We all worship the Lord, we all fear. Do you really hear what I hear? In Jerusalem, we said, we'll meet next year. So we all came back to our God to draw near. But do you hear it? Do you hear? Messiah brought here, 
resurrection brought now, fire and fishermen and a funeral not two months old beneath the mocking gaze of our overlords? The absurdity, the audacity, I can, it cannot be true, I cannot believe my ears. But I have to. I came to hear my God. And how can I refuse him when he speaks in so gentle a tongue as mine? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and beyond, he said. What a story that is to spread. Who will believe it? Who knows? But tongues wag and hearts burn. And my language now has a new word, an inflection of love. <laughs>